we, we got a deal. I said, I got only nine minutes, and if I go a little bit over, he says, don't worry, man, I got a big hook. I'll just pull you off of here. I have to apologize that I have to go through these slides quite rapidly, but nine minutes is nine minutes. Uh, to give you an idea of who I may be, if you haven't been around the, the meeting uh, last night, uh, I've done this before. Uh, I've been the co-developer of the first lithium-powered pacemakers, and then uh, developed the St. Jude heart valve, which was bought out by Abbott for $30 billion. Been also the uh, co-inventor of the ATS heart valve, uh, which was later on bought out by, by Medtronic. But the work that we're going to be talking to you about is something that we began around uh, 2014 when we were working on a project called Kipps Bay Medical in which we were taking uh, vessels and strengthening them with nitinol wire before putting them on the heart. It was going quite well, except a little thing called the uh, Great Recession came in and interfered with that. So we revisited how we were going to do that. And instead, we decided, why not make an artificial graph, OK? Now, of course, a lot of people said, Manny, you're crazy. But then I said, well, you know, we've done this before. Uh, we've, we've had the experience. And so we decided to go after it. Uh, and the reason, very simply, is that uh, heart disease is still the number one cause of death. It's not the COVID. It's not cancer. But still, heart disease is our, our number one killer. Now, typical patient comes in, goes to the doctor. Ah, I got chest pain. What are we going to do about this? The doctor will look at and do, a, uh, do an angioplast, not an angioplast, but an angiogram, and will say, Charlie, you got some blockages, OK? Uh, we're going to take, take care of them by trying to open up those blockages with a standard balloon, which we will attach a stent that will not only open up that blockage, that lesion, but we will leave behind a stent that will help keep it open. Gee, doc, that works. I don't feel any pain anymore. OK, go home, Charlie. All right, however, in a relatively short period of time, maybe two or three years uh, in some cases, some cases maybe in a couple of weeks, uh, doc, I got that pain again. Well, let's take a look. Well, it turns out that, again, you have a situation where you have developed other blockages. Uh, the, the stent that we put inside of you is uh, totally occluded, so we're going to have to go and do a bypass on you, meaning that we're going to try to take vessels out of your body and connect them in such a way so that we can go around those blockages, and we are going to do bypass surgery on you. Now, the image that we see in front of us right now is what I would call a double bypass, in which you have a, a lesion in the uh, right coronary and also a lesion on the uh, LAD. However, to do that, we have to harvest vessels from your body. And the typical method that we use, primarily outside the US, but still also in the US as well, is that we will have to fillet your leg, for lack of a better word, open up your leg, as you can see there, and pull out the saphenous vein. And in 23% of the patients, we still need more vessels that so will open up your arm as well to pull out the radial arteries. Endoscopic harvesting has helped in reducing some of this uh, trauma on the legs uh, and on the arms, but still require a, a situation where you have a, a very highly trained technician that has to use about $1,500 worth of disposable to open up the legs and the arms to try to pull out these vessels, cauterize them, et cetera. And unfortunately, this procedure is not well accepted because it really does a lot of damage. But it is what it is, and this is what we have to work with these days. Now, how big of a market this, is this? Well, typically, bypass surgery is in 800,000 to a million patients per year on a worldwide basis. And the average patient receives between three and four grafts, typically. Triple, quadruple bypass, whatever you want to call it. Which means basically three and a half grafts. Not that you walk around with a half a graph. I always have to say, 
it's an average, okay? Which means the market is somewhere between two and a half and three and a half million graphs done annually. And so our concept is simple. Why can't we develop an artificial artery, a small diameter graph for cabbage, okay? Sure, it's gonna have to be thin, flexible, compliant, strong, et cetera, and things like that, okay? And from a, a desirable point of view for the surgeon, something that's very surgeon friendly, ability to cut it anywhere he wants, it can have a long shelf life, et cetera. So that we end up with an image on the right-hand side there, uh, which shows uh, uh, those two purple vessels that you see as vein grafts, we replace them with an artificial graft that we have developed, okay? Even the artery graft, the, uh, what we call the, the lima, going from the top all the way down to the bottom, we can eliminate the need for harvesting that vessel by using one of our grafts as well. Now, a graft, what about it? Well, it's a synthetic polymer in which we build a, a scaffolding out of this material, okay? And then we strengthen it with a nitinol support system that will then allow the original synthetic polymers to disappear. Go away, go home, okay? And then re be replaced by your own endothelial cells. That is to say, the, the endothelial cells of that patient. In doing so, we end up with a graph that is very unique to the patient with his or her own cells. And more importantly, when it disappears, where do the endothelial cells hang about? Well, they hang on to the nitinol structure that we put around. So as a result, the, the artery that we finally end up with is stronger, more durable than any vessel in your body. What is very interesting, although we're not at this time uh, doing much work on it, is that this structure can be used basically in any part of your body, not just the coronary area. Now, how does it work? Well, we started our animal studies back in 2017. We first started with, with pigs, but we went on to the ovine, that is the sheep, because we were doing studies that were longer and longer in time, and the pig just outgrows the table, all right? They get quite big, so we ended up doing uh, sheep. We typically scan these animals for 30, 60, and 90 days because by 90 days, you're pretty well set to go into humans, okay? Uh, we began using the latest materials and planning these things, and now we have graphs that we have machined and created that are now approaching 120 days, a typical go-ahead milestone that we typically do. In fact, we now have animals in, in excess of 180 days, I think recently we, uh, we crossed a 200-day uh, timeline. Now here is what we can do the way we're doing this. You, you may ask the question, Manny, why are we showing th the same graph three different times? Correction. This is three different animals, three different implants, and yet they look identical. That's what we've been able to do, is create graphs that are virtually identical. This is a nice thing for the doctor and a little entity down in, in Maryland called the FDA. They like to see repeatability, and we're able to show this. We now have sheep over 180 days, and if I hit this button again, will this thing run? There we go, okay. There we are, sheep. That is over 180 days. Now, we've been able to bring in some very, very, very top, as far high as you can go in our experience of uh, uh, both med tech and business advisors. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, we have Dr. Lyle Joyce, who was the previous chief of cardiac surgery for the Mayo Clinic. You may have heard of that place. It's over in the mid part of the country in Minnesota, okay? And, uh, and his son joined him as well, does the heart transplants. Then they both went to uh, Wisconsin to develop a new heart center there. 
Well, they're advising us, okay? Uh, we have Bob Emery, who helped me develop the St. Jude heart valve. He's a retired surgeon. Uh, and we have Dr. Gene Myers, who's done over 20 or 30,000 coronary and peripheral uh, angioplasties. We know the heart very well. Uh, earlier today, you may have heard John Babbitt, a, a partner of uh, Ernst & Young, talking about m and He has worked for me in the past, okay? And I say to John, John, okay, you can stay at Ernst & Young, you can do anything you wanna do, but if I ever get hit by a truck, guess what? You have to take over and help my guys. So we got everything covered. On the right-hand side, you see uh, Dr. Rakavan, one of the original developers of the material that we're using and the techniques that we're using at the University of Iowa where we got the original licensing from. Another partner, maybe you've heard of this guy. Again, they're located in the Midwest part of the country, the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic approached us saying, we want to collaborate with you because this is a very important project. We will help you with your animal work. We want to be our participants in your clinical trials. And by the way, do you need any money? I said, <laughs> does the bear live in the woods? Of course I need money. And so they, they kicked in some money as well. I don't know how much time I use, but if we have any time for questions, I'd be more than happy. I must say one thing, okay? Um, let me see if I can go a little bit further. Put the hook away, will you, for a second? Okay, all right. I have to read this thing to you, not read the whole thing, but we are doing, uh, we're approaching the idea of doing our next financing as a reggae, and I have to show this slide, otherwise I get in trouble, okay? But thank you very much for your attention. I'm, they're gonna put me in a room over here if you wanna talk to me, and it'll be fun, okay? Thank you. <laughs>